Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship on this day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we are gathering here this morning in the home of our Heavenly Father, we know whenever we are in our parents' house, we are home. So whether this is the first time you've ever gathered with us or if you've been gathering with us for years, welcome home, everyone. A little side note here. When I'm walking up the aisle, I always just love hearing the chatter. It's just fun. Every once in a while, I hear something that makes me do a double take. I just heard Dick saying, hey, call 911. I don't know what that conversation was, but I don't want to know. Okay, well, then we're just not going to worry about it. I don't smell any smoke. I think we're okay. So, Okay, all right, all right. We're good there. Uh, <laughs> we will be celebrating Holy Communion today. We'll do that in a continuous fashion as we normally do. We'll come up to the front of the aisle, uh, receive the wafer from me, and either the red wine or the clear grape juice from the deacon, and then dropping our cups into the uh, garbage can that'll be sitting here uh, once we reach that point in the, uh, in the service. With that, I'll invite you to go ahead and get up out of your seats. We'll join together in our first hymn. As we gather our hearts for worship on this day, we know that there are those things in our lives that stand in the way of our relationship with our maker. And so now I invite you to a time of mutual confession as we join together in the brief order found on page 56 in our hymnals. We gather this morning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment now for personal reflection. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. 
Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us join in reading responsibly from Psalm 1 as printed in your bulletin. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on God's teaching day and night. Their leaves do not wither, everything they do shall prosper. Therefore, the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Let us pray. Direct us, O Lord God, in all our doings with your continual help, that in all our works which begin, continue, and end in you, we may glorify your holy name. Finally, by your mercy, bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
Our first lesson for this morning comes from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his commandments, decrees and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give your ancestors to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Our second lesson is the letter to Philemon, verses 1 through 21. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to a pi- whoa, that's a fun one, a- to that lady and the next dude, <laughs> a crip, um, we're just going to skip that. Wow, those are hard words. Our fellow soldier into the church in your house, grace to you in peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and for your faith towards the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all of the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, Yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Here ends the second lesson. I think we're going to skip... There's two of you out there. Kids, God loves you. Yeah? Okay. I'll invite the congregation to rise now for the gospel. Our gospel lesson for today, the 13th Sunday after Pentecost, comes from Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all of your possessions. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated.
People of God, may the grace and peace of our triune God be yours today and forever. Amen. I had a weird thought occurred to me last Friday as I walked over to the post office. Now, many of you are familiar that I tend to do this. When it's nice out, I, I walk over to the post office and grab the mail. And I just have this little time away, just walking, kind of meandering, letting my, my brain kind of go. And it occurred to me, as I was reaching down to put the key in the box to open it up, I have no idea what I'm going to find in this mailbox. And do we ever know? It's a mystery until we open it. Now, on Friday, it happened to be a big manila envelope for my wife. Don't even know what was in there, but she got that. Two bills and a catalog. Yay. Some days, we get really fun mail. Some days, we don't get mail because there's nothing in the box. And some days, we get lousy mail. It's a mystery. You might even say, it's an adventure. I mean, that's a stretch, but, you know, you could. But it also occurred to me that when I make the walk over, you know, the roughly five-minute walk over to the post office, I never know exactly what's going to happen either. Now, I can kind of anticipate I'm going to walk on down the highway and it's going to be fine and cars are going to come by and hopefully no one swerves and hits me. That would be bad. But I kind of anticipate what to expect, but I never know. Maybe a cat is going to run in front of me and grab my attention, or maybe the birds are going to be going really, really crazy that day, or, or maybe as I'm walking, I'm going to see someone drive by that I know, and i got to wave at them, or, or maybe I'll run into somebody else and we'll sit and chat. I never know. It's an adventure. Did you ever think about that, that it can be an adventure just walking across town to go to the mailbox? It is, though, because we don't know what's going to happen. Now, that's the idea that I want to hold on to. We don't know what's going to happen. Now, let's get into this odd little teaching from Jesus for today. We're about halfway through this thing, this part of Luke's gospel known as the travel narrative. It's a really long portion. It starts in about chapter 8, goes all the way to chapter 18. Jesus has turned his face towards Jerusalem, and he's on his way there. Now, he's going to Jerusalem for two different reasons. He's going for the Jewish uh, festival of Passover. So that's really the setting that is taking him there. But Jesus also knows what's going to happen there, which we are aware of as well, the events of Holy Week, when he will eventually be arrested and he will be uh, tortured and killed and then he will raise again. So Jesus is going towards that. Now, throughout the course of his ministry, he's been attracting crowds for a wide variety of reasons. We know he teaches and people seem to like what he, what he has to say. Large crowds gather around him. They've witnessed the various miracles that Jesus is up to. There's a lot of things going on. Now, also, he's got some opposition. Some people don't really always like what he has to say. Some people really like what he has to say. But because of this, all of these people seem to be following along as Jesus is just kind of walking. And I don't know what's going through his head in this particular moment. But for some reason, he stops. And he turns and he looks at all these people, and he seems to be asking the question, why are they all following along after me? And so he poses what seems to be kind of a really weird question, one that sort of makes me scratch my head. He basically seems to ask the question, why are all of you following me? Since you're following me, let me tell you what that's going to entail. Anyone who does not hate their entire family and even their life cannot be my disciple. Huh? Isn't this the guy who will later say they're going to know that you are my disciples because of the way you love each other? So, what? He says this, and then he says, unless anyone picks up their cross, they cannot be my disciple. Hmm. What's he talking about? From there, he tries to apparently explain things. And he gives us these two little metaphors, these two little examples that honestly, I don't think really help that much. Who among you is going to go build a tower and before you start does not first sit down and count the cost? Do I have enough resources? Because if I don't and I just go out there and start and I get halfway through and I run out of resources, everybody's going to look at me and say, ha, you're funny. No, you'll sit down and count the cost. Or what king going out to war with a force of 10,000 people going up against another king with a force of 20,000 people will not think to himself, this is probably really dumb, I can't pull this off, and so I will send for peace, counting the cost. (sighs) Weird teaching of Jesus. It almost 
seems like Jesus is telling us, if you are going to follow me, if you are going to be my disciple, first there is this checklist. And if you can do this, and you can do this, and you can do this, and you can do this, you can walk through this wonderful portal, and magically you are now my disciple, and everything is glorious. Doesn't that seem like what he's saying today? It's weird. And I thought about that, and I thought, can any of us really count the cost? Can any of us really know what's going to happen? And the answer to that question is no. Of course not. Because we don't know what life is going to look like, do we? Life is an adventure, just like going to the post office. Maybe we can figure out I think this is probably what's going to happen, and this, this might happen, that could happen, maybe, but I don't know. None of us really know what we're going to encounter, what's going to happen in life as we follow along after Jesus. And I think Jesus knows that. Because Jesus experienced this life just like we do. And I think Jesus knows life is messy, isn't it? Life is strange, it is unexpected, it is at times wonderful and at times terrible, and likewise we are at times wonderful and at times we're really selfish and things don't work out very good. And I think Jesus is well aware of that, and if there's any truth that we find in the Bible as a whole, it's that. Life is messy. Whoa, 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 yeah, life is messy. (laughs) And I think God knows it. So what do we make of this strange little teaching that Jesus is giving us? Is he giving us a wink? Like, if you think that it's all about a checklist and making rules, then you're never going to make it? Is that what he's talking about? Or is he recognizing and pointing out the fact that life of discipleship, life of following Jesus, life of following the, the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives and doing our best to live in this world in a way that is pleasing to God is hard? and it's difficult, and none of us will ever fully make it. That's the amazing thing about this world that we are a part of, this world that God calls good but not perfect. We know this world, this reality, it's amazing, but it's broken. It's not perfect. And likewise, we who are also a part of this reality are also good but not perfect. I think about this a lot. Human beings are kind of amazing. Every single one of us is, is created bearing the divine image of God, and I think that means that we have an amazing ability to put love and joy and hope and peace and creation and all kinds of things into this world. We can do amazing things, but every single one of us also has the, the equal capability of causing pain, causing hurt, and putting brokenness out into the world. Both and. That's the reality of who we are. And I think God knows that. And so if this is the case, and every single one of us look to God, and maybe we think about that second little parable that Jesus tells about a king who's going out with a strength of force against someone who's way stronger than they are, maybe just maybe, That stronger king is God. And not just 20,000 to 10,000, his strength of force, God's strength of force is innumerably bigger than any of us can stand up to. And so we should be asking God for peace, right? Maybe, um, hmm, I cannot pull this off. God can destroy me if God chooses. I need to ask for peace. But here is where the gospel takes that and flips it on its ear. Whatever it was that Jesus was going to accomplish in his life and his death and his resurrection in Jerusalem, which is where he's going, by the way, he is somehow creating the peace from God. The peace that we need, the peace that we are not worthy of, but we beg for it, has already been given to us through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. God desires to be with us and to heal the relationship with us, so God has created peace where we cannot. That's the gospel. But it's not easy, is it? We can never truly live up to it. 
And when we're honest with ourselves, I think that's humbling to note that the God who made all of us loves us despite our inability to ever earn it. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem in this moment that we read about today to accomplish that which we cannot wrap our heads around. He's going to accomplish that which God has promised to each one of us. And the promise is there for every single one of us when we reach the end of our life and we experience that promise for ourselves. That's the peace, that's the joy, that's the hope that we find as we follow Jesus and as we recognize our own failings and we thank God that that peace has been given to us through Jesus. Amen. Our service now continues as we offer back to God that which he's first given us with our offerings. we gather our offerings, a few announcements to share. Uh, just a reminder, today is our last Sunday on our summer schedule, so you all showed up at the right time today. Good job. Uh, next Sunday, though, is Rally Sunday, and with that, we will have a schedule change, and we will be kicking off our program year. So next week, week from today, education will start at 9 a.m., uh, featuring Sunday school and confirmation. Uh, Jay let me know he's going to actually hold off on the adult class for about a month. You're thinking October, right, Jay? Um, so he's got some scheduling things with that, but that will be coming down the pipe here in about another month. Uh, from there, then, worship will move to 1015, 
And um, also adult choir will be kicking off next week. They'll be practicing after worship next week. So that's all happening uh, a week from now. Um, one other thing that I wanna point out that's coming down the pipe two weeks from now, an exciting time from within our congregation, we have an ordination that will be happening. And I'm only slightly really, really, really proud because it happens to be my wife, which is really cool. Uh, but she has been called to be the pastor uh, at St. Paul's over in Trainer. She'll be starting there at the end of this month. She will be ordained uh, as a pastor the afternoon of uh, September 18th over at St. Timothy Lutheran in Omaha. Um, if you want more information on that, let me know. Uh, but it will be happening here in a couple of weeks. Really exciting uh, for our church and for our congregation. Uh, with that, I will now invite the congregation to rise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior took bread. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. It is broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. The table is prepared and all are welcome to join in the Lord's Supper.
by the congregation to rise. And now may the body and blood of our risen Lord and Savior strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. By the congregation to join now in the prayers of the church. Lord in heaven, on this day which you have made, we gather our hearts and our minds together as a community of faith. We thank you for the gift of community and the opportunity to worship as we do. We ask that you would continue to connect us together with all of the body of Christ around the world so that we might be strengthened and learn from one another and that we might be empowered to be your hands and feet in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, it is humbling to recognize the truth of what a life of discipleship will entail. Help each of us to hold on to the hope and the peace found in your promises so that when we encounter hardships or difficulties which were impossible to predict, we can find the strength to endure it. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed Spirit of God, we pray today for all those in need of your healing touch. We ask that you would be present with all who are suffering in any way, whether it is physical or spiritual or emotional. We pray for those suffering from illness or injury, for those enduring medical treatments or recovering from medical procedures. We pray also for those whose mental well-being is a struggle, that they would find peace. And we pray for any who are mourning the loss of loved ones, that they would be comforted. Today, we remember especially Janet, Galen, Waverly, Maisie, and any others that we hold in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. God of the world, as we move from the season of summer into the fall, and we begin to feel the effects of cooler weather and see the first changes in the fields, we continue to pray for the upcoming harvest, which will soon be upon us. Give strength to the farmers for the work which lies ahead, and when the harvest is gathered, we ask that it would be plentiful. Lord, in your mercy. God of all people, we pray for those who find themselves lacking the resources which they need, especially as we consider the reality that cold weather will soon be experienced. We think of those who are lacking shelter and food. Guide them to the resources which they require and help all who have more than enough to help to provide for those who are lacking. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we pray for those who are leaders at every level around the world, whether their work affects small local communities or the nations of the entire world. Give all who lead a sense of servanthood and help them to be mindful of those that they represent. We pray especially for those who are active in places or situations of tension and conflict that peace would be achieved. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we pray for those who have been pushed to the margins or have been harmed by an abuse of power. We pray for the day when all people are treated with true equity due to our common humanity. Help those in positions of authority to stand with those who have been harmed. Lord, in your mercy. Finally, Lord, we pray today for those who do not know you. May the gospel of Christ continue to move throughout the world and touch the hearts of all people so that one day all may come to faith. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. People of God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.